Okay, let's take a look at these uh, discussion questions uh, and I'll share what I found when talking about them with you. So, question one What is being romanticized and how does it do this? So, I was talking with the group over there about this question and they noted that two kinds of scenes were often romanticized in the film. The first is Road scenes, scenes on the road in the van. Uh, and these are scenes where the group of young people are having fun together. There's music, there's laughter and chatting, there's uh, marijuana and, and alcohol. And there are no authority figures. Crystal and usually Jake are not in the van. So it's really a sense of community, the sense of a group of friends having fun together uh, and enjoying music, enjoying life together. So here we see things like uh, movement and music and youth. And also class as well, because everybody is stuck in the same van. They're not all in different cars. It's um, to save money. So there's also the issue of class as well. Um, class can also be tied to issues of uh, racial subcultures because the music they often listen to is uh, rap and hip hop, which is more popular. I should say more, more creators of rap and hip hop are black people uh, than white people. So race and class are also connected here. The second kind of scene uh, that group mentioned is the sex scenes. When Jake and Star are having sex, um, it's also romanticized. You see the images are not realistic, they're not clear, the camera is moving around, you have shots of the grass and the sky and nature. It's creating like a very dreamy situation when they're having sex. Uh, so here we have ideas like beauty, natural beauty, and also the beauty of the human body. Uh, you also have movement in terms of the camera and also how the human body moves. You have nature because Jake and Star only have sex outdoors. Uh, the second time it's even on the grass, which is kind of disgusting, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, and also romance, right? The, the element of love or at least of sexual attraction. Uh, in the van scenes also, the camera is always moving. Uh, you have shots of the sky and what they see outdoors. Um, so like all of these elements seem to go together to create a sense of a dreamy, romantic, fantastical environment or atmosphere. When these young people are together or when Star is alone with Jake. But the fact that it is romanticized means that it is not realistic. It means that the film is emphasizing some things and de-emphasizing other things. So when I talk to that group about what are some aspects that maybe the film does not want us to think about, what is the film hiding? Well, for the road scenes, maybe we are not seeing moments of chaos when the group does not agree, when the group is having a fight. Maybe we're not seeing scenes of when the van gets lost or like when they run into situations. Uh, in terms of the sex scenes, you know, most sex scenes in movies are romanticized because actual sex is not always positive. There are negative aspects to uh, the physical act of combining bodies together. Uh, especially if that happens outdoors on the grass uh, with no protection from nature. So um, for the sex scenes, that kind of romanticization is pretty conventional, but it's still there. Um, and also in terms of the way that Star and Jake have sex, there's also kind of like a power struggle thing going on that could be uh, darker if we think about the fact that Jake is technically Star's boss. Um, 
they're not exactly equal in their gang. Um, but because they're so, uh, or at least because Star is so sexually attracted to Jake, uh, it seems like a good thing. It doesn't seem like a, a dangerous thing or something that she should worry about. And that brings us to question two. I was talking to this group over here about uh, power dynamics and sexual power dynamics. Uh, and they they noticed that uh, you in the crew, in the gang, most of the gang members are equal. And then you have Jake. And above Jake, you have Crystal. So there is a hierarchy. There is a question of power. Um, and they mentioned that um, Jake seems to also have the job of seducing new young women into the gang. And so like for every new girl he brings in, he gets $100. But this information is presented to us by Crystal. It's not presented to us. It's presented to Star by Crystal. And it seems like Crystal says this in order to try to make Star fall out of love with Jake. She's trying to disillusion Star. She's trying perhaps to regain control over Star's attention and focus. She wants Star to focus more on selling magazines, focus less on falling in love. So should we trust this information? Is Crystal a trustworthy source of information? Well, not entirely. If she has a motive for presenting this information to Star, she can't be entirely trusted. At the same time, we do have evidence that maybe what she's saying could be true. So let's look at both sides of this question. Assuming that Crystal should not be trusted, that Jake is not just seducing new girls into the group. We do have evidence that Jake does have some feelings for Star. Um, in one scene in the house after Star comes back late, Jake keeps asking her if she has sex with another man, and he feels very angry and can't trust her. He's jealous. If his only job is to bring new girls into the group, why would Jake feel jealous? And if Star's already part of the group, why would Jake have sex with her twice? So it does seem like maybe he does have some feelings for Star. On the other hand, uh, when Star first joins the group, Jake gives her some stickers. And then when Star shares with another group member that, oh, Jake gave me some stickers, the other girl said, oh yeah, Jake gave me some stickers too when I first joined. So. It is true that Jake is using some tricks to manipulate uh, the girls that he finds for the group. So should we trust Crystal? Half and half. She's just like um, the movie. She's emphasizing some points and de-emphasizing other points. So it is true that Jake is using a sexual power dynamic to control some of the gang members, but it's also true that a sexual power dynamic presumes a sexual relationship, and a relationship presumes two directions. So Jake controls the girls, but the girls also have some influence on him. But then there's also the question of Crystal. We already talked about how Crystal wants to break Star's love struck focus on Jake, tries to bring uh, Star's loyalty back to the group and to Crystal herself. And she does this by using Jake as a weapon. Uh, that group mentioned that there's one scene in Crystal's motel room where Jake is forced to put lotion onto Crystal's body as she stands there in a bikini in front of Star. Uh, and that group said this scene seems to be designed to show that Jake is controlled by Crystal, not by Star. That Jake's loyalties are to Crystal and not to Star. Again, another effort to try to get Star to focus more on selling magazines and less on falling in love. Uh, and the way that Crystal does this is by using her own sexuality as a, a means of controlling Jake. 
So yeah, in this movie, there's a lot of sexual energy, but it's always connected to some kind of power dynamic. And that brings us to the second part of this question. Should we consider Crystal part of the group? Uh, when I was talking with that group about this part, they said yes, because she is part of the group. She gives orders. She uh, interacts with the group members. They are one unit. This is true. On the other hand, she is not an equal member of the group. As they said, it's all the group members and then Jake and then Crystal. So Crystal is not an equal member. In fact, we can even say that because Crystal is not entirely part of the group, she makes the other people feel like one group. She is the outside force that makes the group come together. To give a very brief example, um, you guys all feel like one class because all of you are listening to me talk right now. I am the outside force that is creating you guys as a class. If one day I showed you a movie and then I left and you guys were allowed to do whatever you want, you probably wouldn't feel like one class. You would feel like different groups of friends. So there is an outside force that creates the group in the movie, and that outside force is Crystal. And she knows this. She uses this. As a good business manager, she comes up with rituals and schedules and rules that everyone has to follow. And by following those rituals and rules, everybody feels a sense of solidarity, togetherness. We're all in this together. We all have to do the same thing. So like the basic rules that Star has to memorize when she first joins the group. Or the rule about uh, if you sell the least number of magazines that week, you have to fight another person. All of these things that they do, that Crystal orders them to do, creates a sense of uh, community among the group members. And Crystal works very hard to make sure that they feel like a group. When Star falls in love with Jake, Crystal tries again and again to make her fall out of love. Or, I don't know if you remember this, we have one scene at the end of the week where each group member has to tell Crystal how much money they made. And they have to whisper the number into her ear. They can't just tell everybody, oh, I made this much. And the reason she does this is so that the group doesn't compare between themselves. She wants to keep the group one group. She doesn't want everybody competing with everybody else. So she doesn't let people know how much money each person made. It's kind of like after you took the midterm exam, I did not tell everybody your score. If you all knew everybody's scores, maybe there would be some kind of discussion or maybe you would feel like, oh, that person is so smart or that person is so stupid. You would not feel like you're all the same in the same group. And that's why Crystal doesn't share, doesn't let people share how much money they make. As long as they're not the least seller, as long as they don't make the least amount of money, everybody is the same. Uh, the next question, I talked to the group over there about the dangerous situations that Star puts herself in. We, I think we can all agree, her job is not a very safe job. It's always full of danger. But the film seems to tell us that there are certain moments when Star is especially in danger. It's not just a dangerous situation, but something dangerous is actually about to happen. So we're not just looking at what happens, we're also looking at how does the film tell us. Uh, so for example, one thing that the film does is whenever there's no music, it gives us a sense that maybe something dangerous will happen. This is connected with the first question, because when the group is together, there's always music. It's a safe space. They're a group together. They support each other. 
But when Star is out selling magazines and there's no music, that's when it feels like she is alone. Nobody is supporting her. Nobody is protecting her. For example, when she jumps into the car with the three rich white men in cowboy hats, and they go to the men's home and have a barbecue, and they get Star to drink a lot, and then uh, they trick her into jumping into the swimming pool, and we learn that Star cannot swim. That entire scene, no music. Uh, and it also is a scene where it's three against one, three men against one woman, three rich people against one poor person, uh, three people drinking a little versus one person drinking a lot, three people who can swim versus one person who cannot swim, and of course, the house and all of the land is owned by the men. If Star, but I think we can agree it feels dangerous. If something dangerous actually did happen to Star, she had no way to escape. Uh, and actually, the we also get a hint. I'm pretty sure you don't remember this, but after Star jumps into the car, we get a shot of the sky and we see a bird, one small black bird flying in the opposite direction. It's as if nature is warning Star to run away. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Jake comes in, shoots a gun, scares everybody and rescues Star. And in the stolen car, as they're driving away, they hear the sound of a train. And it's like the outside world is welcoming Star back uh, away from the dangerous situation. Another scene that seems kind of dangerous is when Star is selling magazines to the poor neighborhood. She enters a house with uh, only two kids. Again, no music. Uh, and also, it's the only scene in the movie uh, after the beginning section where there are no adults. Star is the oldest person in the room. It, so again, it gives us a feeling that maybe things are out of control. Maybe something unpredictable and dangerous might happen. Because there is an adult somewhere. We just don't know where the adult is. It's like a horror movie. Um, but it turns out the adult is in the room. The adult is high on crystal meth asleep on the couch. Um, a drug user. But the scene is very carefully planned. We don't know Star's reaction to uh, using this kind of drug. In her own home, uh, they, her, her father drank and smoked but didn't use drugs. At least we don't see him use drugs. Um, and among the gang, they also smoke marijuana and drink, but they don't use heavy drugs. But here, for the first time in the movie, somebody is using crystal meth, bing du. Uh, but it's at the very end of the scene. It's just before Star leaves. So we don't know her reaction. She was already going to leave. Uh, but it, it is a sign that this could be a dangerous situation. It's something new. It's something unpredictable. Therefore, it could be dangerous. Um, and then the last like sense of danger comes when Star uh, is trying to sell magazines to the oil workers. If you remember, the van drops off the girls, they party, and just as they're about to sell magazines, the men have to go back to work. Star sees an opportunity, uh, runs and jumps into one of the pickup trucks. And at this point, we're already sensing maybe this could be dangerous. She's joining them. She doesn't know where they're going. But then we get a sign that it really is dangerous because uh, when she jumps into the pickup truck, she pulls out her brochure. She tries to say, oh, so what kind of magazines do you want? I have all of these magazines. And one of the men says, really? You're still trying to sell us magazines now? Which means that the men are expecting her to do something else. So again, it's a moment when Star has lost control of the situation. And that makes it feel dangerous. 
Also, no music. The music ended when the men have to go to work. Uh, now, it turns out that uh, these men uh, do want to uh, buy something else from Star, but they're not total monsters. They don't try to take it from her. Right? They negotiate a price. Uh, and so that meeting later in the middle of the night, is it starts off pretty dangerous, right? The man says, or Star says, where are we going? The man says, it's a surprise. In that kind of situation, I don't know about you, but I would not want a surprise. I want to know where we're going. Thankfully, it turns out okay. Uh, there's nothing really terrible that happens. Not good, but it's not like terrible. Um, so it starts off feeling dangerous, but the film doesn't give us other hints of danger. Not like the three cowboys, not like the poor household. Uh, once we know what's going on, we get a sense of control over the situation. It doesn't feel as dangerous. Same thing for when Star uh, sells magazines to the truck driver. She jumps into his truck. Again, she's in a man's situation. She's traveling to somewhere she doesn't know. But it turns out this man is just an old guy who wants to chat with somebody. He owns a cat. In movies, usually uh, people who have pets are more trustworthy. So that's a sign from the movie that this man is probably not dangerous. And there's music. There's music. Uh, the man plays Bruce Springsteen songs on the radio. Once again, music is a sign in this movie that there's no real danger. Question four. Nobody took this question. I should say I didn't give this question to anybody. Um, so let's talk about it now. Why is it so long? If you think about the story, it could have been much shorter. Right? Star joins a group. They sell magazines. She falls in love. She falls out of love. She gets in danger sometimes, and but she makes it out alive. It doesn't have to be almost three hours long. So why is it so long? What is so much of the time spent on? Um, I think most of the time is spent on atmosphere, the feeling of the film. And this connects back to the previous question and also question one. The film puts us in a very specific world. It gives us a very specific and different sense of what is good and what is bad, what is right and what is wrong. It's not a kind of situation that most of us are familiar with. So the film has to teach us what situation is good, what situation is bad. So it the film can't, and because the the determining factor isn't logic. The determining factor is a feeling. So the film has to make us get used to the fact that this feeling means good. That feeling means bad. The whole situation is a bad situation in a general sense. The, the job is not a safe job. The boss is not like a caring, supporting boss. Uh, there's drugs and and uh, alcohol and cigarettes everywhere. There are too many people in the same car. But the film teaches us that these uh, dangers are not actual dangers. They're just a regular part of the job. And that when there's music playing and when the gang is having fun, that is good. Those are the good moments. And once we learn that these are good moments, then when you take away the music, when you take away the other members of the gang, and you put star in different situations, then we can feel that these situations are bad situations. So the film trains us to, to recognize these feelings as good and those feelings as bad, and that takes time. It's not something you can just talk about. You have to make us feel it. So could the movie have been shorter? From this perspective, it could have been a little shorter, but you can't really cut too much. This movie was what? Two hours and 50 minutes or something? It could have been cut to like maybe two hours and 20 minutes if you cut out all the nature shots and you cut out all like the, you cut out half of the party scenes. 
could have worked. Um, but it wouldn't feel like a real world with real people that we could be interested in following around. It would just be like a, a story. It wouldn't be an experience. It wouldn't be telling the experience of the main character. It would just be saying this happened to these people and that's good and that's bad. It wouldn't feel like a movie. Uh, it wouldn't feel as immersive. It is the word I'm looking for. Um, and this is an important point because this movie is not entirely original. This movie is based on a New York Times news report of real magazine crews going around the US selling magazines like this. And if you read the news report, it's a very negative news report. Like most magazine crews are filled with abuse and violence and sexual abuse and drug use. People want to run away, but they don't know how, where to call for help. It's just a really terrible situation. But the filmmaker saw something romantic in this kind of situation. The filmmaker thought if we could have a magazine crew that did not have most of these serious problems. There is some violence, but not a lot in the movie. There is no sexual abuse in the magazine crew. And uh, most of the crew members are happy to be there. If we could portray a positive crew like this, what kind of romance, what kind of adventure could we see in this kind of story? From that point of view, therefore, um, the magazine crew work situation is still dangerous. You still have a, a controlling boss like Crystal. You still have the weekly fights. You still have the drugs and the alcohol. But by showing us that these are only potentially dangerous and not actually dangerous, the film can then tell us what is actually dangerous. And that needs time to train us. That's why it takes so much time uh, to properly introduce the world of this movie. Question five. Uh, again, I didn't assign this question. I assigned this question to you guys. Do you want to think about question five? No? Yeah, OK, so I'll talk about question five. You might be thinking, wait, the two halves of question five don't go together. One is about the male gaze, like how the film treats men and women. The other half is about poverty, how the film treats class. Why are these part of the same question? Because both have to do with looking, the way that the film wants us to look at something, the way that the film presents something from a certain perspective. So the first half, the male gaze. The male gaze is the idea that when presenting people and situations, there is uh, very basically when presenting men, it's presenting men as uh, equals, friends or enemies or partners or competitors. But when presenting women, it's presenting women as not equal. They are potential sexual partners. They are potential sources of danger. They are uh, belonging to the power structure of somebody else uh, and not presenting women as equal pe uh, persons in their own right. This logic can be extended not just to people, but also to the environment. So like this situation is controlled by this man that situation is controlled by a woman who's actually playing the part of a man. This kind of logic. Does this film do that? I think on balance, no. If we go back to question two about the sexual power dynamics, yes, there is a lot of sexual elements in the film and they are used as uh, control, but they're not coded as male. Uh, Crystal trying to control Jake and Star using her sexuality. The way that she uses her sexuality is 
hard to directly translate into if Crystal were a man. You can't just change Crystal's gender and keep everything the same. It's specific, it's specifically tied to the fact that she is a relatively young and attractive woman. The way that the relationship between Jake and Star is portrayed, uh, we're always following Star around. Right? The camera always is focusing on Star, but it's focusing in a way that puts us in her head. We see her perspective, we see her reactions. She is portrayed as an equal, as a full human person. Whereas Jake is portrayed as kind of a mystery. He's portrayed as attractive, but we don't really know a lot about him. He is the source of uh, middle management in this organization. Uh, but again, we don't really know him as a person. And that's why when Crystal tells Star the story of Jake seducing new girls for the group, it's possible. We don't know enough about Jake to say that it's not true. It's possible. So on balance, there are a lot of moments of like showing young and beautiful women and young and not as beautiful men in the movie, but they're not shown as objects. They're not shown as unequal. They're shown as like people, full human people who just happen to be younger and more attractive women. It's not a defining trait. Uh, and then the second half of the question, is it poverty porn? Is it showing scenes of poverty to like say, oh, look at how crazy this situation is, or like look at how fortunate you are that you don't live in this kind of situation? Uh, again, I think no. There are some scenes of poverty, like the beginning scenes when Star is leading her two younger siblings to uh, look through the dumpster, look through the trash can for food. Or later on when she tries to sell magazines to that poor household and she looks around the house and it looks so familiar to her own house. But the, we're seeing these scenes from Star's perspective. We may not be used to that kind of environment, but Star is. She doesn't feel like that uh, poor house is dangerous, at least not at first, because it's a similar situation as she grew up in. It felt familiar to her. So like when she's looking around the house and she notices the details of like how dirty the place is or the empty refrigerator, it's not saying, wow, look at how crazy this is. It's saying, wow, I know this kind of lifestyle. I know this kind of household. And with the addition, I guess, of why am I trying to sell things here? They're obviously not going to buy anything. Um, so thinking about this question highlights the idea that the male gaze or something as like a, a poverty porn does not just depend on what you see. It also depends on how the film shows you. It's not just what's in the movie. It's also how what kind of perspective the film uses to show you these things. And question six, I talked to that group over there about the ending. Uh, their answer was that uh, when Star set the turtle free, that seemed to symbolize like uh, getting rid of something in her heart, like some kind of complex, especially because the turtle was given to her by Jake. It's a symbol of their relationship, the relationship between uh, Jake and Star. So when Star lets it go, it's like she's letting go of some questions about their relationship. She's letting go of some unpromising hope about their relationship. Maybe she was hoping they would get together and then at that moment she realizes, no, she, she and Jake will never be a solid, stable couple. Something like that. And then later when she uh, follows the turtle into the water, this group says it's kind of like a rebirth. It's like a a new baptism, so she. It's like a new start. Um, it's only the second time in the movie we see Star underwater. Uh, 
the first time, of course, is in the house of the three rich cowboys. She's tricked into the water. The cow one man says to her, oh, you can just stand there. It's not too deep. She goes in. It is too deep. She finds herself underwater. She comes back to the surface and she says, I can't swim. So in that earlier scene, she's kind of manipulated into the water. It's not her choice. Uh, and that's kind of a key moment when we realized maybe these men can't be trusted. Maybe they don't really care about her safety. It's a turning point. It's the first moment in the film where we truly see and feel actual danger for Star. But in the ending scene, Star goes into the water by her own choice. She wants to enter. Uh, she is in total control of the situation. So it's another kind of turning point, this time turning toward the positive. She is now in control. She knows what she wants. She can decide for herself what she wants to do next. So this group pointed out that this is kind of an open ending. We don't know what she's going to do next. Will she stay with the group? Will she leave? Will she give up on Jake? What's going to happen? We don't know. What we do know is that whatever she does next, it will be her choice. She is clear about her situation and she can decide for herself. And that fact, I think for the first time in the movie, she is entirely in control of her own situation. That fact makes it a hopeful ending. Even if she chooses wrong, it is her choice. Okay, do you have uh, thoughts or questions about today's discussion? Okay, so let me give you some details about what we're going to do next week. Next week, you are going to present your short films to the class. Um, so as it says here on Moodle, just to remind you, your short film should be under 15 minutes long. It, you can use English or Chinese or both. You must have English and Chinese subtitles. Now, before next week, let's say by next Wednesday, please upload your film to YouTube and send me the link. Uh, tell me like which group you are and then give me the YouTube link. I'm going to put it all on Moodle so we can play the short film more efficiently next week. So that's by Wednesday. On Thursday, next class, I'm going to uh, invite each group one by one to introduce your short film. You can all come to the front. You can send a representative to come to the front introduce your short film, uh, then we're going to play your short film, and then we're going to see if there are any questions. We're going to do a Q&A. The introduction and Q&A should be in English, please. Uh, we have seven groups, seven times 15, six times 15 is 15, 30, 60, 90, hour and a half. So hour 45 minutes. Yeah, we have a lot of time. Don't worry. We're going it, to, it'll be fine. Now, as you watch uh, each group's short film, please also give them a grade between one and five here. Give a grade to the final project of every other group from one to five based on creativity and quality. These two words can mean many different things. Creativity, the idea. Is it a good idea? Is it a new idea? Is it an idea that could be turned into a movie? And quality. How well did they take this idea? and make it into a movie? Is the movie itself high quality? Um, did the group have a clear idea 
of how they want to use the camera, how they want to use editing, how, what kind of acting they wanted. So creativity is more about the plan, the idea. Quality is more about the actual product, and that's when you can think about all of the filmmaking elements, right? Acting, cinematography, editing, sound design, special effects, um, things like that. At the same time, you should also give a grade to your own group members. Give a grade to your own group members, but not yourself. Also from one to five, depending on how much they contributed to the project. Contribute can also mean many things. Of course, if someone is an actor or a camera person or a director, they contributed. But they can also contribute by joining a discussion and sharing ideas. They can also contribute by coming up to introduce the film and answering questions. They can contribute by making sure everybody follows the schedule uh, and by reminding your group members to give a grade to everybody. Any action that helps the group is a contribution. If you have a group member who you've never seen before, or they come to a group meeting and they don't say anything, you can give that person zero. But it, you have to be sure it is absolutely no contribution. As long as they did anything to help the group, you should at least give them a one. Um, so where do you put these grades? You download this Excel file, peer review sheet. It looks like this. So on the left, you have the grades for your own group members. Please tell me your group number. And for each group member, the student number, Chinese name, and then the score, one to five. And if you want, you can add some more information in the notes. On the right is where you give the grade for the other groups. Each group just gets one score, one to five. These scores, okay, so how will these translate? Okay, so after you fill out this form, please upload it to Moodle here. On the same day, June 20th is next Thursday. It's the same day. So as soon as you're done filling this out, please upload it to Moodle before midnight. If you don't upload a peer review sheet, you will get a lower grade on your final project. So what am I going to do with your grades? How will this turn into your final project grade? Your final project grade will be uh, my grade for your group is 50%. The other 50% is the average of everybody else's score for your group. So, I use Chinese to explain. Very good. I use Chinese to explain. You, the final grade of the final grade, half of it is for me, half of it is for the other groups. And then, the final grade of the If your group members say that you contributed very little, I could reduce your score a little bit. If you submit the peer review sheet late, I will reduce your score. So as long as you follow the rules and you did contribute a lot to your group project, your score will basically be how good is the movie. Uh, it's one to five, right? So your score will be out of 10 and then times four because the final project is 40%. Questions? Okay, so this means next week, please come on time. If you're not here to watch the movies, it's hard to give a grade to the other groups. And if you don't fill out the 
peer review sheet and submit it on time, your grade, your personal grade will suffer. So please come to class on time next week. OK, do you have any questions about anything under the sun whatsoever at all? OK, so for the rest of today, you can use this time to continue working on your project, and I will be here if you have any questions.